Um, <clears throat> any other comments or questions about lab two, lab one? Lab, lab one's Lab one is being demoed today. Do next week, yes. That's right. Any other questions about lab one or lab two? So lab two, like, like according to your schedule, we would start it next week, have two weeks, and then maybe do it in like three weeks from now? Yeah, so lab two starts next week. You have two weeks to do it, and it's due three weeks from now. So all the labs are two-week labs, I think, in this class. All the labs are two-week labs, and then you have one week to, to write them up and hand it in. So let's talk some more about op amps. <clears throat> and I want to talk a little bit about the non the non-ideal aspects of op amps because that allows you to reason a little bit about circuitry. <clears throat> One thing I said at the, last, at the end of last lecture was, was to consider if it was possible to use one of the op amps we have in the lab, the LM358 I, I, I get jammed between that and the 386. 358, one question was, why use two op amps to get a gain of 10,000? Why not just use one op amp and use a one meg feedback resistor and a 100 ohm resistor here? We have a ratio of 10,000 to one. We should have a gain of 10,000. <clears> and one consideration is the is the gain bandwidth product I'm going to talk more about today. You have to make sure you're within the gain bandwidth product of the op amp. You have to worry about feedback that you don't expect, that is to say spurious capacitance across this connection if you build the board incorrectly. But there's one other thing I forgot to mention, which may keep this yes, any Pardon me, what? Noise? Yeah. Oh, noise is a problem, but that's a noise whether, that's a problem, that's a problem whether or not you use two stages or one stage. All right. But there's yet another problem with this. There's a non-ideal ideality. And let's say we can produce enough current here that we don't have to worry about input offset current. You'd like to believe for an op amp with no feedback for an op amp with no feedback, that V out, let's call this V plus and this V minus, you would like to believe that the output V out is equal to V plus minus V minus times some gigantic gain over J omega tau plus one low pass filter. We'll talk about a little bit more about that in a minute. But real op amps actually have a term here that's more like plus V plus minus V minus minus some small constant. It's called the input offset voltage. <clears throat> so let's say we had a gain of 10,000 here. Well, first of all, let's go back to the other circuit. We had two op amps, each with a gain of 100. Let's say the input offset is a millivolt. So we have a gain of 100. That means that the output here, the, the offset at the output due to error is 0.1 volt. But then we high pass couple this to the next op amp. That 0.1 volt disappears because it's DC. We now have a 0.1 volt offset here due to the input offset. It's not a problem because we're running at 5 volts and zero. Now with a gain of 10,000, let's say we have a 1 millivolt offset here. Now the output, the output offset is 10 volts. If we're running at 5 volts and ground, what you're going to see is 
saturated op amp. You won't see any output at all. So you have to consider the input offset voltage as well. And I don't happen to remember what the input offset voltage of this op amp is. Does anybody have a lab page open? Crystal? As long as you have a laptop open. I love to do this. People with open laptops, you make them look up constants for you. <clears throat> so LM358 data sheet should have an input offset voltage and I just don't remember what it is. You can buy op amps that have any arbitrarily small offset voltage. They're called precision op amps. And they cost more. You can buy them. Uh, that might keep you from doing this in one stage. It's worthwhile building this in the lab and seeing what happens. It'll take you five minutes to build it. Why not build it and see what happens? Do you have a number on that? I want the input offset voltage. So, for right now, we're going to treat the op amp as a device that has this kind of characteristic so that if we were to do a, a Bode plot of log frequency versus log output, we would find that we get a a curve that looks like this where the slope on a log log plot is minus one because the log of one over omega is minus pardon me? Three three point nine millivolt? Two point nine millivolts. Oh this won't work then. So it just won't work. So unless you unless you got really lucky and the op amp you happen to have that day, happen to have a low offset, this times 10,000 wouldn't work because the output would always be saturated. Sorry about that. How much did it differ uh, from manufacturers? It varies more by type of op amp. And a precision op amp can be as low as a few microvolts of offset voltage. And in fact, there are op amps that are chopper stabilized that measure their own offset and zero it. But you, what, what, you better be ready to pay for that. Wouldn't the input op offset of two voltages in the series still be up by 10,000? Yes, it would, but because you're AC coupling this in the center between the two, you're getting rid of the first offset because you have a filter there. So if you DC coupled it, yes. But if you AC couple, no. And that's why we're AC coupling this. That's why we're having high pass filters in the signal path. So this point up here is A, corresponding to the DC gain. Question? OK. So. It, at, if omega is equal to zero here, then J omega tau must be zero, and this gain goes to A. So at low frequencies, the gain is A. The gain starts to drop at the point where J omega tau is approximately equal to one in magnitude. In fact, it goes to half amplitude, where J omega has an has a amplitude equal to uh, or omega tau has an amplitude equal to one, and so omega here is going to be something like one over tau at this point, and this slope is minus one. And for op amp, as we said last time, for the op amps we're using, the cutoff frequency, the open loop cutoff frequency, is about um, oh ten radians a second. Maybe, maybe 20 radians per second. Very, very slow. One or two hertz.
So we have this device. A might have a value of 10 to the sixth. So we have a device that for any reasonable input is saturated. Anything over a microvolt or so is saturated and is grossly uh, low frequency, has a grossly low frequency cutoff. And the way we get around that is, of course, feedback. But let's play with the, play with the uh, equation a little bit here. So at low frequencies, now let's just, the, just look at low frequencies here. At low frequencies, we have V out is equal to V plus minus V minus times A. And we can, of course, rearrange that to be V out over A is equal to V plus minus V minus. So if A goes to infinity, if A goes to infinity and V out is finite, then the difference between V plus and V minus must be zero. So that's the first golden rule of op amps, is that for any finite output voltage, you're going to have the difference between the positive and negative input equal to zero. So to be useful, you've got to give this thing some feedback so that you get some bandwidth out of it. And uh, I want to motivate the idea of a gain bandwidth product. Gain bandwidth product is being a, a useful measure of the goodness of an op amp. Graphically, it's where the gain of the op amp falls below, the frequency at which the gain of the op amp falls below 1. But I want to motivate why that matters. So, So let's say that we have a really simple op amp circuit here. V in. We have equal resistors here. The input is grounded. The negative input is grounded. And so if we have V out, then the value of the voltage here must be V out over 2. V out over 2. But we know that V in and v, out, uh, v minus and V plus must be equal. V plus and V minus must be equal. So we can, we can say that V out is equal to V plus, which is equal to V in, minus 1 half V out one half V out times A over J omega tau of the amplifier plus one. Say again? This? Okay, V plus is equal to V in. V minus is equal to one half of V out. Okay. So Rearranging this then, we have that J omega tau plus 1 over A times V out is equal to V in minus 1 half V out. If A is huge, if A is huge, or Really, if this term is small, if this term is small, then the output is equal to twice the input. So, hmm. Well, 
So this has to be small compared to to one. It has to be much less than one. A depends on the amplifier, but in our case, it's around. Yes, and in our case for 386, it's about uh, a million. Yes, called the open loop gain. That would be called, A would be the open loop gain. So we can then ask, we can then ask the question, over what area of omega is the approximation that V out equals 2V in valid? So graphically then, if we plot log omega versus log of j omega tau plus 1 over a, and what we care about is that j omega tau plus 1 over a be much less than 1. Well, what do you mean by much less than? Mm, depends on the problem. We can plot, we can plot j omega tau plus 1 over a, and it looks like this. Where does it cross? Where does it cross the value 1? It crosses the value 1 where the magnitude of the numerator is equal to the magnitude of the denominator or where where omega tau over a equals 1. Because a is a big number. The 1 doesn't matter at all. We can just ignore it. A phase shift doesn't affect the magnitude of the number. Just changes the phase, obviously. So all that matters is omega tau times a. So, but tau, the time constant of the, ampl of the amplifier, the, t the, the, RC t the effective RC time constant of the amplifier is proportional to 1 over the cutoff frequency. <clears throat> so we have omega over A times frequency, uh, uh, yes, A times frequency equals 1. Wait a minute. What did I do here? It passes through 1, where omega tau equals A. And what, I'm, what I want to show is, what I was, where I'm going with this, is that the gain that that's given by the gain bandwidth product. Oh, right. Omega is equal to 1 over f equals a, or omega is equal to a times f. So where omega becomes equal to the product of the cutoff frequency of the op amp times the gain of the op amp, the approximation completely breaks down right here. So when you specify the gain bandwidth product, what you're saying is, at that frequency, 
whatever low frequency approximation you made, whatever approximation you've made that A is big is no longer true. So how much lower frequency do you have to get for it to be true? Well, that depends on what kind of error in the gain equation you can tolerate. If you can co tolerate a 10% error in the gain equation, then omega has to be an order of magnitude lower than the gain bandwidth product. If all you can tolerate is a 1% error, then omega has to be two orders of magnitude below the gain bandwidth product. Now, how good are the resistors you're using to set the gain? If you're using the resistors that you pick out by the handful in the lab, these are 5% resistors. You're not going to do any better for the gain here than the square root of 2 times 5% because these are randomly picked. You expect the errors to go something like is the square root of the sum. So, so you would guess that maybe 7% accuracy is as good as you can do and so being a factor of yeah, 14 or so below the gain bandwidth product is good enough. Using 1% resistors for precision gain then you have to have a bigger ratio between the frequency and the gain bandwidth product. Hundred volts per millivolt, so that's only ten to the fifth. Okay. And what's the gain bandwidth product? Four hundred kilohertz. Something like that. Four hundred kilohertz, I think. <coughs> Pardon me? Unity gain bandwidth? Unity gain bandwidth. That's 0.7 megahertz. Points, oh, a little better than I thought. So, <coughs> you're asking for a gain on, on, the, on the original 2 op amp diagram that I drew last time. You're asking for a gain of 100 on each op amp. You're asking for a gain of 100. The gain bandwidth product is, is 700 kilohertz. That says that you surely, once you do this, once you set these to a gain of 100, that the bandwidth of the op amp is not going to be better than 7 kilohertz. Yes? So as long as all of the objects are linear, that is to say you haven't saturated any of the op amps, as long as all of the filters are linear, then as you know, linear operators commute. Therefore it does not matter. If one of the, if one of the elements becomes nonlinear, for any reason, then the ordering of the gains matters a lot. But as long as all the elements are linear, you can commute them in any order and the response is the same. So when you're reading an op amp data sheet, you're always, always going to look at the gain bandwidth product. You're going to look at the open loop gain. You're going to look at the input offset to see if you're going to saturate the, the amplifier by too high a gain. And in practical terms, you often have to look at the input bias current. You have to find out if you're, 
how good is the approximation that I equals zero into each of the inputs? Some current flows. It's a real circuit. It matters whether it's milliamps, microamps, nanoamps, or picoamps. It's quite easy these days to find an op amp that has picoamps of gain of input bias current. That's tiny. The leakage current off your finger is a few picoamps. So um, it's easy to find a, a op amp that has good bias current, but you have to check the specs. Well, let's say that there's another trade-off here, and that is that the more ba get bandwidth you want on op amp, typically the more current it draws. Let's say you want to go to nano power amplifiers that draw less than a microamp each. Their gain bandwidth product might be a thousand hertz. Then it matters. And so there's a, there's a trade-off in power. You can get extremely low current op amps if you're willing to run them at low gain or at low frequency, which is where you want to be for um, biopotentials. It's quite possible to build a, 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 an ECG amplifier that'll run for 1,000 hours off of a 3-volt cell. Don't even put an on-off switch on it. The on-off switch costs more than it's worth. There is one nonlinear effect you have to worry about often in op amps, and that is that the output stage of the op amp may become current limiting under certain circumstances. And when that happens, when that happens, you get a, a nonlinear rate limiting effect called a slew rate limit. So for large signals, for large sine waves at the output, Let's say you're going almost rail to rail, almost from the negative supply to the positive supply. As you turn the frequency up, what you may see, instead of a shrink in the output waveform size, which would be a linear effect, a shrink in a phase shift, what you may see is this. It may be count become almost a triangle wave because the current limiting means that it can only change the voltage into some load at a constant rate. This is a nonlinear effect. You generally want to avoid it unless, you're, unless your goal is to make triangle waves and then it's very good. What's the slew rate limit on this op amp, as long as you got the... Point 0.3 volt per microsecond. 300 kilovolts per second. So no way you're going to get an output waveform that, that, that changes faster than that. And you could do the calculations for the for DVDT of a sine wave and for small sine waves, small sine wave outputs, you'll never get to that frequency. You'll never get to that limit. But for large signals, you may. So is there a class that talks about these uh, the, the non-idealities of op amps? Is that 2100? They all they do the ideal op amp.
as opposed to the effect on the circuitry. Yeah, you never really get a sense of like the What does it mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Okay, so the, and I haven't run into that particular limit very often with real op amp circuits, but most of the stuff I do is fairly low frequency also. So most of the time, you're going to be able to, as long as you choose the op amp so that the input current is low, so that the input bias current is low, you can assume the first golden rule of op amps is that the current into the plus terminal is equal to the current into the minus input terminal, which is equal to zero. <clears throat> and the second rule is going to be that as long as there's some negative feedback, that the input at the positive terminal voltage at the input, po at the input terminal is going to be equal to the voltage at the negative input terminal. <clears throat> you can use that to reason about op amp circuits in a very general fashion. For instance, the canonical differential amplifier which has negative feedback, I'm drawing that in, but has a balanced input where this is R, R, this is G times R and G times R is quite easy to analyze because of these conditions. We can immediately say, let's call this V1 and this V2, that's to discriminate that from V plus and V minus. We know immediately that V plus is given by the voltage divider equation because no current flows into this node. And so the value of the voltage at V plus must be GR over R plus GR. <clears throat> the value of V minus well let's just pick a current direction and stick with it. We're going to have some current that goes through like this. Um, the, the voltage at V minus then is going to be given by, well first of all let's get the current. The current must be given by, what are we going to call this? We'll call this uh, V out here. The current is given by the way I'm writing it, V2 minus V out over R plus GR. So we have the current divided by, the voltage divided by the resistance must be the current. So that V minus then so that V minus is given by V out minus the voltage drop across, or plus the voltage drop across GR, which is GR times V2 minus V out over R plus GR. And now to solve this, we just set this equal to that. And chug away for a while, and what we'll find is that V out is equal to G times V1 minus V2. So it's a difference amplifier. It has ideally, ideally, it has zero gain for two voltages that are the same. In other words, so if I apply the same voltage here, that would be called a common mode voltage. So if I applied a common mode voltage, a common mode voltage V, 
the output would be zero for any value of the input voltage? That's a good thing, yes. This is true because the gain is high. Remember I said that? That was one of the first things I wrote on the board today. This is true because the gain is high. Yes? If B plus equals B minus, does it change the geometry of A times B plus minus B minus? Would it be absolutely zero? Remember the gain is infinite. Right. So zero times infinity is any value you like. We can put an approximate here if you want, but in, pra in, pra in practice this is a rather good approximation. The common mode gain here is zero. That's cool. Let's say that you have these V1 and V2 correspond to two electrodes sticking on the skin, right? So you have one on your, on your leg and one on your arm, and you're trying to measure a, a cardiac potential between them. But superimposed upon that, on that small potential, superimposed upon that small potential is a 60 hertz sine wave this big because you're, you happen to have flopped your hand over the power cord on your laptop. And so it's cu AC coupled into your hand. It's capacitively coupled into your hand. Probably the AC coming in is going to be common to both of the inputs. It's going to be a common mode voltage and therefore will be subtracted away and you won't see it. So a differential amplifier then is used to get rid of interference where you have a large annoying voltage applied on top of a small voltage of interest. Would anybody like to tell me why this is a lousy differential amplifier? <clears throat> that's one, that's exactly, that's one effect and that is that it's very hard to exactly match these resistors. So if we have a a 1% mismatch in these resistors, then the gain mismatch is going to be on the order of a percent. And, an amp and a sine wave that is 100 times as high, which is not unreasonable, will come through at the same amplitude as the waveform of interest. So you have a, so this circuit requires horribly good matched resistors. I mean, they have to be extremely good match to get even 1% or a tenth percent accuracy. That's difficult and it's, it's expensive <clears throat> because that means that some human has to measure every resistor and choose the ones that match. That's no way to build a cell phone. So or an ECG. But there's another problem with it which is even worse than the match. Yes? Low input impedance. This assumes that the driving impedance of these two voltages, that the Thevenin and equivalent impedance of these two voltages is zero. If these are finite input resistances, then you have effectively a series resistance here and here, and if these are electrodes on the skin, there's no way those are going to be matched. They're going to be random series resistances added in. You're guaranteed a mismatch, and in this case the mismatch might be 40 percent, and you'll have no common mode rejection. Just for scale, just, just to set your expectations at the appropriate level, the, the fairly cheap INA121 differential amplifier that we're going to use in lab for experiments, I say fairly cheap, they're actually $5 each, folks. 
don't blow them up. <clears throat> I have 20 or 30, but I don't have two or 300. The power supplies are 10 bucks each. The isolated power supplies, don't blow those up either. <clears throat> INA-121 has a common mode rejection of 106 decibels. So that is about 10,000 to 1. That's phenomenal. You say, yeah, my God, how did they do that? Well, we can analyze it. But the result is that nobody in their right mind builds their own differential amplifier. Use op amps for all kinds of things, but if you really need a differential amplifier, buy it. Because the ones you buy are vastly better than anything you can construct. <clears throat> the the before cell phones, before smartphones, there were PDAs, personal digital assistants, like the you know, they had resistive touch screens on them. Even some of the first cell phones had resistive touch screens, one touch at a time. It turns out to read those screens required differential amplifiers. To make the cell phones cheap, they had to drive the cost of differential amplifiers down. You can now buy an extremely high quality differential amplifier for pennies. It's in a tiny package, it's hard to deal with. <clears throat> physically, but they're very good and they're very cheap. So you could build a, 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 a cardiac monitor that lived on top of the battery holder for a three volt cell. These are tiny, tiny chips. SOT23 package. SOT23. I think it is a very interesting exercise to take cheap commercial electronics, consumer electronics, and take that technology and divert it into scientific gear. Because there's all kinds of cool things that have been made cheap, like, like the VCR. When I first, you don't think of that, when, <clears throat> when I first started the first video recorder I had for scientific use was a Sony reel-to-reel. -reel. It was portable because it had a handle on it. It weighed 40 pounds. You put it on the desktop. The camera head was this big. You could, you know, it was barely a single-handed camera head, so you put it on a tripod. <clears throat> this thing was used for years until the VHS VCR came along and because they made billion of these things the, the machining which was good to a micron the, the machining of the heads which was good to a micron or two suddenly became free on a, on a scientific scale dollars and that Sony recorder just got thrown onto the trash pile because it was poor quality heavier, slower, it had no redeeming characteristics except for maybe now historical value. Uh, but, but the diff amp now is, is, is dominated by cell phone. If you I, most most diff amps are instrumentation amplifiers are diff amps usually it's really the same thing. So there's so the so the diff amp package as it now exists is almost always a configuration that is some variant of a three op amp device. So the INA one twenty one is an eight pin device but inside it is three op amps. And the connections look like this.
these companies are able to get it right because they're making these resistors on a vapor level? There's a couple of reasons. Let me let me put off that question for a minute about about wafer level resistors. Typically, these four resistors are all equal, and they are all on the wafer. They're all on the same substrate. It is easier to match them if they're all equal. And these are extremely closely matched. Secondly, the inputs are isolated by follower amplifiers. And so, any reasonable loading, any reasonable Thevenin equivalent input voltage, Thevenin equivalent input resistance doesn't matter because the input impedance of this is giga ohms. And third, let's call this R21, R1, R22. Secondly, Thirdly, this particular topology of resistors means that the matching of these resistors does not matter. Now, I could prove that to you if you want to take a little while, take 15 minutes. But you can show by brute circuit analysis that the only place that R21 appears in the output equation is as a sum with R22. That says that the individual values do not matter. The only thing that matters is the ratio of the sum of these to this resistor. In fact, this resistor is almost always external. because it allows you to set the gain by changing a resistor. Yeah? Reference is ground in my case, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so we can we can do the circuit analysis and what we'll find is that the gain is um, let's see it is the sum of these divided by this, the differential gain here, the, co the common mode gain is 1. And these resistors are commonly matched to one part in 10 to the minus 4 because they're laser trimmed in fact on the same substrate. They are hand trimmed but not by a human. They're what would you call it? Claw trimmed by a robot? Anyways, they're laser trimmed and the common mode rejection then is given by the product of this small number times the gain of this stage. And you can easily get for a gain of 10 you get 106 dBs, 110 dB, 100 dBs of, of common mode rejection. With that kind of common mode rejection, again, don't build these. It's way too hard.
100 dBs means, 100 dBs of, of common mode rejection means the signal could be a thousand times, the noise could be a thousand times bigger than the signal and the output will still be usable. As long as nothing becomes nonlinear, as long as, the, as long as the noise does not get big enough to saturate the amplifier, then all bets are off. Any questions? These are quite robust. I've, I've, I've used them in various ways. I took one of these, hooked a copper wire to each one of these inputs, duct taped them to my chest, just the raw copper wire. No, no, no electrode gel, no nothing. Just duct tape the wires to my chest, record a perfectly good ECG. Kind of hurt pulling the duct tape off. <clears throat> That's amazing. It's amazing it worked at all. So, um, yeah, you can get a lot of use out of these. And, and in lab three, I'm going to ask you to do it, build an EMG using these. So I'll ask you to put a differential pair across a muscle or put an electrode on the muscle and then another electrode far away from the muscle so that it has a, a, a decent neutral reference and look for contraction potentials. <clears throat> so do you want to solve this? We have enough time. You want to see how this works? It's, or is it clear how it should work? What you're going to end up doing is to is to write this voltage as a function of the equivalent feedback impedance write this voltage as a function of the equivalent feedback resistance and then subtract the two because that's what the diff amp does and what will come out then is a is the uh, gain equation I'll just write the final gain equation. Sometimes I have people solve this for homework. For this class, I'm assuming that you're self-motivated enough that if you want to solve this, you will do it. And if you get stuck, you'll ask a question. <coughs> the, if this is V1 and this is V2, then the output is then the output is of these two stages if this is V out 1 and this is V out 2 then the output here V out 1 minus V out 2 is equal to 1 plus R21 plus R22 over R1 times V1 minus V2. So again, these resistors don't have to be matched because they appear only as a sum, never as a ratio. So, 
Op amps are used for a, a bewildering variety of things in the real world. They're used linearly for gain of cores. They're used linearly for filters, linear filters. They're used both linearly and non-linearly for oscillators. If you want a sine wave oscillator, you would use it in a linear mode. If you want a square wave oscillator, you would use it in a non-linear mode. They're used for pulse generators in a non-linear mode. They're used as virtual grounds. Virtual ground. A virtual ground looks like this. Since this point is zero, ground, this point must be zero, which means this point is held at ground, but with the interesting addition that because we have a, an output which is holding this at ground, we can measure the current through here and find out what the current to ground actually is. So now we have a ground, we can ground a circuit and measure the current into the ground and do it quite accurately. When I was in college, though, we had a digital computer, a digital computer for the, for the college. Uh, it did a, a killer 200 ads a second. And we had an analog computer, which was all op amps and capacitors and resistors. The line to use the digital computer was 50 people long for physics lab, the line to use the analog computer was no people because no people knew how to use it. So I, learned, I taught myself how to use the analog computer because it was faster overall than waiting for the digital computer. And in, when, you're, when you're using op analog, when you're using op amps in this fashion, you always use them in operational mode, which is to say you have some impedance Z1 here and some other impedance Z2 here that does a computation for you. For instance, if you if we have a resistor as input and a capacitor as feedback and we ground the positive input we have an ideal integrator. It does the mathematical operation of integration. We apply a, an initial condition as a voltage across the capacitor. So you would apply a V init here, often meaning you just close a switch and short it. But you apply a V init here at t equals zero. You, re, re, you remove V init and you let the system evolve in time as a dynamic system. And then you plot the output of the dynamic system on an oscilloscope. Or in the case of when I was in college, we used a polygraph with m moving pens on paper. Yeah. This was a long time ago but it makes a nice permanent record. I still have them. I could still read them. And so the system dynamically evolves then as a, as a system and it does the calculation for you. It calculates the differential equation because you can do, the, you can do sum, you can do difference, you can do products, you can do integration, you can solve differential equations. And in those days, it was actually faster to solve them on the analog computer than the, different, than the digital computer, because digital computers were so dog slow at the time. <clears throat> well, let's talk a little bit about another. Eh, we're getting pretty close to the end. I won't start on active filters. If you had to hear something about op amps at this point, now this is a small enough group, I can tune the lectures here. We're, we're far enough ahead, I can tune the lectures. 
we are, we're, we're sort of getting warmed up for, this is kind of base information for lab one, but it's also base information for lab two, for the EMG stuff. So we're getting far enough ahead here that I can divert and talk about other things, or I can go into some detail if you want. If I was going to detail on op amps, for instance, what would you want to hear? If you want to hear something else, what would you want to hear? As we go through the semester, there'll be time to fit in all kinds of things. Uh, do you want to hear a lecture on state of the art of uh, body area networks? That would be f so you, body area network where you have the, the limitation of the network is your skin. And so you shake hands at your peril. Because you could get an information virus that way, as opposed to a you know flu. <clears throat> but but so so you could have so there are various ways of 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 keeping information on your body. Let's see that you you have a high frequency signal, very low power but high frequency. Almost all the energy is on your skin because of skin effect. The inductance of, of, of a conductor pushes high frequencies to the surface. So if you put a patch or a capacitor against your skin, so you have a layer of mylar and then an aluminum plate, non-toxic because of the mylar, you could pick up a, an, indu an induced signal off your skin. You could transmit back on, onto your skin. And you could have a, a packet network that was putting information over your skin with no wires and no wireless. Right? It's, it's not transmitted, it's not broadcast, it's limited to your skin and a small distance outside your skin. Yeah. You touch the touch the uh, the person you have to transmit it to, and it goes to them. Yeah. More more likely, or or more practically, perhaps you could use it for medical instrumentation, where you'd have a you'd have a recorder that was fairly heavy duty sitting on your belt someplace, or near your skin with a with a big Wi-Fi transmitter in it, or a or a or a telemetry or a cell phone, and then you'd have sensors scattered around. That were capacitively coupled to your skin, moving information down to the big, the big global transmitter. So you have body area networks. If you want to talk about brain machine interfaces, we can talk about that. That's more or less creepy. If you want to, but I think what's really creepy is these people, some of whom are at Cornell, who are working on uh, instrumenting moths as as cyborgs. Are any of you involved in that? I, I, I room with the girl that I've been doing this before for the summer. It was basically testing, it was something out of a, what is it, fifth element, right? They basically can control an insect and make them a spot. Right. Put a camera on them, put a little microphone device that controls chemicals that tells them what to do. It's just it, like moving around to spy on people. Did this creep you out? I thought it was cool. Okay, then, yeah, you know. As long as it's only insects, but as you say, what if the what if the moth flapping through the window is a spy, right? <laughs> so what they're doing, but it's creepier than that, folks. So what they're doing is, they you, you know that moths metamorphose from caterpillars, right? You know, sort of vaguely remember that from biology someplace. So the the caterpillar forms a cocoon, and then the caterpillar sort of turns to mush inside the cocoon. They slit the cocoon open, they slide their circuitry into it, they get that in the right place. When the, when the, when the metamorphose completes and the moth comes out, the circuitry is inside the moth. And there's no seams, because it grew around it, including putting growing electrodes, growing muscles through the electrodes, so you can control the muscles directly. I, yeah, it's awesome. It's also pretty damn creepy. It's harder with people. It take too long to grow. That's your only problem with it. 
Yeah, well, they're actually, they're, they're, they're hitting, the, the, the brain of an insect is not too well defined because insect nervous systems are kind of distributed and simple. But, but the idea is to connect into the nerve pathways well enough that you can joystick fly them. Right? And uh, for surveillance or for whatever you want to do. And these are hawk moths, right? These are, they have a wingspan like this. These are big moths. Six inch wingspan. Flap, like flap, 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 flap. <laughs> Whap against the window, the screen shakes. Yeah, you'd probably notice it. So more importantly, how does a keen resolution it doesn't yet some type of bomb? Well, you're flying the camera is not yet a solved problem, I don't believe. Because the, the, the cargo capacity of these guys is, is limited, although they're quite strong compared to, say, a quadcopter. Uh, and they have per unit weight. So, why do you just train four of them to fly in formation? <laughs> <laughs> you can bet you can bet somebody's working on it. You don't need to train them; you just control them to fly. Yeah, you That's say, right. In, in your, <laughs> it'll happen. So we could talk about some of that stuff. If you, I, 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 I tend to talk about, well, go, go ahead. Something about physiology, like, you talked about the nerve, the nerve cells, you know, the sodium, you know, those channels, maybe something. I can talk about physiology all day. Yeah, so, you know, if you want to very be specific, if you want to talk about, say, cardiac physiology, we can talk about cardiac physiology. Uh, I guess I'd be interested in wondering, I know Twitter and research is sort of like, how do you, you mentioned something about, like, taking sensors, getting information from your body, putting it on a cell phone, iPhone, Okay, I'm right. Do you want to talk about that? Maybe. Uh, you, you just outlined Amrit's final project. Um, <laughs> so there's lots of interesting stuff. There, there's really basic stuff, though, that's interesting to talk about, too, and that is given that the leakage current that'll kill a human with a catheter in their, in their, in their, into their heart is around 10 microamps, 10 to 30 microamps, given that the leakage current is so low, how do you design a hospital room to keep all of the possible leakage currents into a human below that threshold? And that is non-trivial. And it's just E equals IR. Right? There's nothing fancy here. But it is really hard physically to do that. So that could be fun to talk about. You know, how do you shield a transformer? Is that actually like a problem? Like yes. Oh, it is absolutely a problem. And there's a, a great deal of technology that goes into preventing it. <clears throat> uh, well, let's say if I were to take an ohm, a voltmeter and, 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 and look at put it into the ground lead on that plug right there and then put it into the plug lead on that ground right there there the ground lead right there these are on different circuits I might get a volt difference between them what's the impedance of that? tenth of an ohm so that can that can put out ten amps through the ground line at a, at a, at a low voltage well okay so I plug in so I have my grounded EKG, I plug it in. So now there's a ground lead on, on a human someplace. Now you take the catheter, you plug it in, uh, the, the catheter pump, you plug that into a different socket, you shove that up into the arm, it goes into the heart, boom. You have a ground path between the two. They're both grounded, but the ground potentials are different. You have a current flow, it kills them. It's really, it's really takes some planning to avoid this. And there are multiple layers of protection in a real hospital to avoid this. Only one circuit per room. Ground the bed. Ground the bed? Ground the bed. Uh, float all the instruments. None of the instruments have a ground reference. You know, there's uh, all kinds of levels of, of of protection. We can talk I mean, about that. Yeah. So, 
Use one circuit helps a lot. Um, if you look at if you look at two plugs on the same circuit, they can have a different ground potential if there is a ground fault any place in the circuit that's drawing current. A ground fault is a is a current to ground rather than neutral. Why is silver chloride the only material that you use for? What are so why what? Why is silver chloride the only material? Oh, I'll talk about you want to uh, that's a that's really interesting why that is. I'll talk about that for sure. Before the before we get to the EMG stuff. I just bought a hundred uh, EMG electrodes um, that are all silver, silver chloride. And um, but we yeah, we should stop now. But we'll talk. We we'll talk. Maybe I'll talk about that next because that is really very relevant for everything you do in this class. Heart physiology. I'll see what I can do on that. Have to get some diagrams. Yes. So more, so more, so more detail like, of that kind uh, of stuff. Specifically, like you know, the electrical engineering approach to physiology. Right. Okay. So, so there's a there's a whole subset, uh, sort of a subfield, which is uh, the the electrical description of a single neuron, for instance, which could be interesting. Basically, you could teach me the book that you gave me about being able to read. Yeah, that's the that's that's the, yeah. There's a. <laughs> There's an old book from the 70s uh, by a guy named uh, Stein. It's called Nerve and Muscle. And it is written by engineer for engineers, but it describes biology. And it's short. Okay. We got a little while before lab now. Um,